All right, so I'm going to kind of go across, AI is a big subject. I'm going to try and touch a lot of little things across the top surface of it. It's, I'm going to try and stay away from the technical side of AI, but give you enough um, information so that you can decide whether you can adopt AI or use it in some way. Uh, I might go at some points too technical, in which case so people just raise their hand. Sam tells me I've got too much content, <laughs> so I might have to, might have to skip some things, uh, and I might have to speak fast. But if I'm speaking too fast, then just go. Just go like that. Slow, slow me down. But uh, my viewpoint comes from, as Sam said, from kind of like a mixture of entrepreneurial, technical, and managerial. So I've been all of those things. And that means that I tend to start at the big picture and work down to the details. A lot of engineers and technical people start from the bottom and work to the top. Where it's, so my viewpoint is, how does this help me? What am I trying to solve? How can the technology, how can I engage with the technology? So I will try to start at the big picture and go down to the details. Really quick, uh, Ames, why do we care? What is it? How do we use it? This is a more extensive agenda. I'm just going to go through these items, tell you where AI came from, why would we care about it now, what is it, the different types of AI, and how can we use it. I thought, I, after talking to Sam, and I was saying, hey, look, I'm not sure whether people understand things, maybe I should try and introduce some topics. I thought, okay, I'll just start with a glossary of some of the, top, some of the words I may use inadvertently, uh, and you might not know what those words are. But basically, all of these words mean is software. It's just software. Model is a piece of software that recognizes something. When I say a machine, it's really just a piece of software. When I say an algorithm, it's a software which is a recipe. When I say machine learning, it's software that learns by itself. When I say deep learning, it's a type of machine learning. So it's all software. Does anyone know who this is? Yeah. <laughs> so I'll move to the next slide. I guess I'm, I've brought her up here to try and illustrate why it might be important for you to understand what artificial intelligence is. She's Elizabeth Holmes, and she created this massive empire by convincing her board and her investors that she had an amazing technology. With, with one drop of blood, she could do all this sort of analysis and determine all sorts of health problems that people might have. It was invented. She didn't have that technology, but she convinced people that she had. So I want to make the analogy with AI here. We, if we're managers or decision makers or executives or business people, we need, in the same way that none of her board and none of her advisors or investors knew that it was impossible at, at the current time to take one drop of blood and do all the sorts of analysis normally take five vials or ten vials. Um, it's important that we understand enough about AI, or in this case technology, to make informed decisions. So, yeah, the board didn't know any better and experts who told them they ignored. A really simple definition of artificial intelligence. Basically, it's just, well, the science that enables computers to mimic human intelligence. Guys have been, well, there's a whole bunch of technology that enables this, but I've cherry-picked some interesting dates which are important in, the AI, in AI history, and I'll show you in a timeline. Of course, there are a whole bunch of technologies and discoveries and um, science that have helped provide the foundation to, all, to artificial intelligence, but I'm going to ignore all of those. That's the other stuff that just appeared. In 1956, a guy called McCarthy got a whole bunch of people together and said, let's create a new type of new discipline, a new research discipline. We're going to call it artificial intelligence. And many of those guys became the kind of leading lights of AI. They became famous people, which we no, no, no longer remember, but they were very important in the, in the start of AI. What those famous people also tended to do is create what are called um, artificial intelligence winters. There wasn't a lot of money at the time for AI, so one researcher would say, that guy's AI is rubbish and it's useless and we shouldn't invest any money in it. But what would happen then is the whole field would die for a few years. So everyone would go, oh, OK, AI is no good. So we had several AI winters early, uh, late 60s. And recently, when we had this kind of more AI renaissance, 
up until maybe a year or two ago, people were still talking about it. Is this a winter? When's the winter coming? Is it overhyped? But it, there's been so much, I guess, commercial advantage with AI now that people have more or less put that on the table. It's unlikely there's going to be another AI winter where no one cares about AI anymore. The other aspect that has brought AI into the consciousness was, or into the, the social consciousness, has been when AI comes along and beats a human opponent at a game. So, Deep Blue was chess, um, IBM Watson was Jeopardy, Deep Mind to 2016 beat, uh, with AlphaGo beat the best Go player in the world. And this tends to catalyze interest to say, oh, we're not so smart anymore. The machines are beating us. They're soon they're going to beat us at everything. There are details in each of these cases. There are some details which we don't hear about. I'll, I'll quickly cover them later, which doesn't make it so self-evident. But it's definitely the machines in certain very narrow areas are becoming super powerful. Finally, I just wanted to say at the end, or what the most recent explosion in AI has been caused by some technological developments, which we really don't need to cover, but they started happening in 2012, where um, deep learning came into the picture and got very good at recognizing things, like recognizing faces, recognizing animals, doing language translation. This was the kind of the more recent commercial explosion or, or interest in AI, caused by a number of technologies, and just in, the, in kind of 2012, 2013. They're AI. deep is just a word they like to use because it sounds really grandiose. All right. right? Uh, it's it's an exaggeration, generally. Deep, um, the company uh, DeepMind, it's a UK-based company, nothing to do with deep learning. They don't use deep learning. They use another type of AI. But deep sounds really good, right? <laughs> okay. So You don't need to read these quotes, but they're basically important people in the field that say AI is really important. It's kind of to, to make my point, but they're basically saying... It's going to be really big, and you better get involved. Of course, some of these people are like uh, Andrew Ng down the bottom is used to work for Google AI and Baidu. He's super well known in the AI field, so he he does have a barrow to push. But um, I don't think they're wrong. There is there is a lot coming. The issue is how do we control it? How do we adopt it? How do we make it to our advantage? rather than to our disadvantage. I've drawn this really nice rocket to explain uh, how, if you can imagine the rockets are the stages, and each one of the stages help propel AI into the consciousness. Uh, and I started with uh, architecture, which I briefly mentioned. We don't need to care about that. We're not, we don't care about the technical side, really. But there were a bunch of innovations in the software field which allowed um, recent uh, like deep learning and machine learning and so on to become very powerful enough to recognize faces or recognize objects. There has been an ongoing increase in hardware performance since 1970s or even earlier. Uh, without that hardware performance, a lot of the machine learning techniques wouldn't work. They wouldn't have the power. There has been, especially with regard to uh, the initial breakthroughs in the 2011-12, those breakthroughs which did this recognition of cats or dogs or whatever only came about because they had a huge amount, or at least Google, had a huge amount of data, a huge amount of photos, or a huge amount of video on YouTube which they could analyze. Because certain types of um, AI, like deep learning, require a huge amount of data to learn. I'll cover that in a little bit. But big data was definitely one thing that helped propel it uh, to success. Now, I think there's another thing which nobody mentions, and that is it's more from the perspective of an entrepreneur when you're trying to create new uh, products or new services, you need to be able to iterate quickly. In 2006, I created a stock management system which took, we used to, it used to take us something like three days to manage uh, stock investments of, of 20 to 30 stocks. I took that to managing 3,500 stocks, and it would run in a few minutes. But I had to write that from scratch. It took me six months, nine months, I was working weekends. I remade that same software using the new software that I could use nowadays, all of this deep learning stuff, 
and I made it in about a week, right? Because the tools are there now that you can so quickly try stuff out. So I'm going to come up, I'm going to spoil one of my stories later on. Imagine you're in Byron Bay, you go to Crystal Castle, you want to analyze crystals and determine the energy of them. You can write something like that, and you, you have to custom make it, but you could write it with the, current, with the tools nowadays in about a day or two, right? If I'd had to do that 10 years ago, I, I probably couldn't do it, right? The tools are so good nowadays that enables that quick idea checking. Right? That's what I think is, so prototyping speed, prototyping speed people don't talk about. I mentioned these guys before, there's a lot of hype when a very human person gets smashed by a machine. Kasparov, I don't know if you, anyone's read Kasparov's book on, I think it's called Deep, have you read it on Kas, Gary no, Kasparov? I know, I know when it happened though, I remember. Yeah, so you read about what IBM did, right? They had a Russian, a Russian speaking security guard that spied on Kasparov. They were, he couldn't sleep, they, they bugged him, did all sorts of things to make him perform very poorly so that IBM would win. Nonetheless, in six months to a year, Deep Blue would have won fairly, right? So the hype comes around. So Jeopardy, similar story. Jeopardy um, in IBM Watson beat the, the best Jeopardy players in the world. The real story behind it is that all the Jeff, all that Deep, uh, deep uh, what is it? No, IBM Watson had to do was read Wikipedia. Basically, all the questions were Wikipedia titles. When you hear that, you go, oh, it's, that's kind of good. It's kind of somehow cool, but it's not intelligence, right? Would we really, exp I mean, if, if there's a computer program that can go out and read Wiki like 10,000 Wikipedia articles in a tenth of a second, do we think that that is intelligence? I don't know. It's a AlphaGo and Go are uh, a bit of a different story. That, that seems to be the real, they really did make breakthroughs there. Um, Go is a really hideously complicated, complicated game, and um, the machine won fair and square. Uh, what you hear quite often is AI, especially from technical people, that AI is the wrong word. Um, they prefer to use these phrases sometimes, like machine learning, or cognitive strategy, or augmented, intelli augmented intelligence. I think the last two don't mean much to people. I understand why the word machine learning is used because it is, is kind of the category that most software sits in that does uh, AI. Um, but it doesn't make sense to the non-technical person. And most people are quite happy with the word AI. When you talk about, it doesn't make any sense to talk about machine learning ethics. It does make sense to talk about AI ethics, right? All of machine learning came from AI research. So why not call it AI? So you will hear people say, AI, hi, you shouldn't call it AI. <clears throat> I grew a little picture here. You can see that machine learning is a really significant part of AI, but it's not everything. Um, the reason why data science sits out, this is for you, Knuckle. The reason why data science sits outside is because data science is normally report-based, right? You do an analysis, you come out with a report. Whereas artificial intelligence technology or machine learning, you, you, it's kind of more real time. You expect constant engagement with the system. Yeah, deep learning is the current superstar. Technical people prefer to use machine learning as a, as a name. Expert systems were used like decades ago. They were the first AI systems that were used. An expert system, you probably, uh, Simon's come across this expert systems. It's that old fashioned thing where you put a bunch of rules into uh, like a doctor AI, and and it and then you then you get the, you ask the patient questions. Do you sneeze? Do you have a red nose? Do you have a runny nose? You have a cold. So it's very rule based, and there are a lot of expert systems in automotive, for example. Um, you can do the same thing nowadays with deep learning, but so expert systems are kind of not really used as much as they were. They're still around, but they still work. It's literally rule-based, right? So it's not an al it's, I mean, there's an algorithm behind the scenes, but it's really simple rule, rule system. You ask, you, you ask a question, you find that rule in the database, you see if there are other related rules, and then you can, you can cascade down and say, get some more information. Okay, they're old, they're overweight, their blood sugar's all over the place, they're likely to be a diabetic. Right. Mature, on mature onset diabetes. 
Um, no, no, they're not learned. Exactly, very good point. They're input manually by the person, by a person, by a human. Whereas machine learning, deep learning, it it's, learns by itself through trial and error. There's, they don't, it doesn't do everything. Of course, there's a scaffold being set up. The engineers put a whole bunch of architectural, make unarchitectural decisions, but to a large degree, it learns by itself how to recognize things or classify things. I'm going to cover AGI now. That's an interesting part of AI. Um, ah, I, here, I summarized that already. AI, is, as a term, is so ubiquitous, we may as well continue to use it. This is a picture from the Terminator. Um, there's like, every year there's a new movie which shows how AI goes out of control and destroys the world. Um, AGI stands for Artificial General Intelligence. It's where machines are as intelligent as humans. Um, it, it, is it is relevant to us. Uh, I'm of the view that the search for machines as intelligent as us is not a good thing. We are uncertain as to what will happen. Will it destroy the world? Will it save the world? I think we could be spending our time on other things in artificial intelligence. And I, I think it's, a, it's kind of a cool thing that a lot of researchers uh, try to investigate. But I think, we, speaking of researchers, I think it's a mistake. I don't think, I'm, just because I think it's a mistake, I don't think it's gonna stop. Speaking of researchers, when, when, when you're in business and you're not a technical person, a lot of what you hear about AI is driven by, I believe, these three groups of people. The AI researchers, they're really important now because they were taken by the big tech companies like Google or Baidu or Facebook. All the most famous um, professors in the world are working for these big companies. So they influence how, how we pursue AI. They influence... Uh, the, the company that beat um, Go, that Lee Sedol, Lee Sedol and Go, they were purchased by Google. So Google thinks it's really important, Baidu thinks it's really important to have these researchers, and to some extent, they influence a lot how we perceive AI. Usually no one cares what researchers do, right? Researchers can say all sorts of things, which is not necessarily good. But in this case, AI researchers are driving a lot of the conversations. The other aspect about AI that um, influences how we perceive AI is that there are a lot of startups up there, out there, <clears throat> a lot of engineers, a lot of talent. They're being funded, especially in America. And they, they kind of... I was talking to John earlier. Was I talking about AMP to you? And AMP uses, outsources a lot of their AI because those tools were already available, right? So. The tool makers have gone out and they've found a niche. They're going to attack certain areas of AI. Um, but the result of that is that you have... They, it becomes very inflexible for you to manage your own AI adoption. You need to depend on them. You can't innovate easily. In the case of AMP, whose name I should not have mentioned probably, um, they've got four or five big providers that, that um, they have to juggle to get anything done, and that's only on the marketing side. Um, finally, I don't know if any of you have heard about DevOps. Yeah. DevOps and other technologies are a trend, right, in the last few years. But it's all about automation. It's all about efficiency. It's all about removing the human from the loop, right? And oh, that's why I've got that word, anti-human. Um, and this also puts uh, almost some constraints on us and suggests that AI is all about automation. AI is all about destroying jobs. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but that it's a really subtle thing. I think it's my opinion that that's what that DevOps thing has driven that to some degree, because that's all about efficiency. It's all about optimization. It's all about automation. It's not about innovation, exploration, experimenting. Have you gone to? Have you ever said to somebody in DevOps and say, "I want to, I want to just want to do an experiment." I want to find somebody with a technical... I want to do an experiment with a dynamic language. They say, no, no, you have to use it. You have to use this language. You, you, you know, we have to be able to test it. We have to have 99% test coverage. Just covering this again, artificial intelligence is the science that enables computers to mimic human intelligence. And 
normally in every article, including one article I wrote a year ago, I would start with saying, oh, these are the categories of AI, but it makes no sense to a non-technical audience. So I'm going to give some other viewpoints. From a business perspective, what do you care about AI? How can you use it? You can use it to automate stuff. So even self-driving cars, which is a pretty like, way out there speculative um, deep learning system, for the most part deep learning, that's automating humans. Um, if you're a business and you decide we need to allocate or we need to optimize things, imagine route planning or imagine filling, imagine you're an Ikea and you need to do a delivery of 10 pieces of furniture, you could do a route plan very quickly which says, okay, we need to get it in this order from the shelves and then we need to deliver it to the customers in this order based on the traffic or based on where people are in the city. That's an optimization thing. Doesn't, and, it, and it's significantly different from the automation, automation thing because it requires different sorts of data. In fact, it requires much less data. Analysis, um, so many of I was talking about ANZ to somebody recently, somewhere, and you guys know, I can't remember now, cool, was it ANZ? Um, ANZ, of course, financial companies are interested in fraud detection, um, and they will use uh, artificial intelligence to try and determine which transactions potentially are fraudulent, among other things. Behaviour, behaviour in the transactions, even from a marketing point of view, are... How often are people at, uh, going to their accounts? How often do people move money around? So that's kind of more of an analysis. I'm going to give you another viewpoint. I'm going to overload you with viewpoints. So I won't go into the examples anymore. But you can look at AI from a human perspective and say, what is the AI doing that's replacing us? And it might be doing something sensory, like recognizing people, recognizing brands. Oh, you're wearing uh, Nike shoes, or you're wearing, wearing uh, particular sunglasses. Um, or another type of sensory thing that might be replaced is a, an AI system might listen to an engine and go, okay, it's running hot or it's running unevenly, right? So it's a sensory thing. A good car mechanic might do that. It might turn on the car and go, oh, there's something a bit off with that engine. Um, the other thing that uh, human intelligence has, a, we have a very specific part of the brain, actually it's on this side, I think, uh, which is used in language translation, language acquisition, uh, lang the way we talk and communicate. And it, it's similar in AI. We have very specific methodologies to do language translation uh, for things like captioning. Uh, so, for example, you might caption, like, a, quite an interesting technology is the AI uses the first sensory aspect to recognise everything that's in a frame within a movie. It says, OK, there's a dog, there's a cat, there's a person and then might, for somebody who's perhaps blind, might say, okay, speak out loud and say, there's a dog, there's a cat, there's a person in this image. Or it might, if it's somebody that might be, speak a different language, it might turn it to text, there's a dog, there's a cat, there's a person, but turn it into Spanish or turn it into a different language. Um, lastly, from a human intelligence pers perspective, when you're an accountant and you're looking, for example, and you're looking at tables or something, you might recognise, okay, we're in the red here, it hasn't balanced here. Um, the accountant knows, with his expertise, knows, or her expertise, knows there's some, some issue here. Similarly, AI is very good at this, recognising patterns, taking a bunch of tabular data and going, okay, we, these are good investments, or, well, I did that exact thing with my company, I just didn't use AI, and that was trying to determine what stocks to invest in. Took a whole bunch of data from Reuters, of price movements, of R&D investments, of anything you could think of, and tried to make predictions. Probably getting a little bit bored, but this is the last viewpoint. On I've had a lot of viewpoints, but this is the most important viewpoint in my view, and that is we, as an organ, in an organisation, or even as an individual, we can make the choice where we want to focus. Do we want to focus on automation? Do we want to focus on improving our experts, augmenting ourselves in some ways? I'll give an example of that. I'll give you two examples. There's an example up there, emotion annotation. There is such a product where uh, an autistic person can see an image and the image is annotated with the emotions and text for the person they're looking at. Because with autism, many autistic people have difficulty understanding what the person, what the person is feeling. So that's an example of augmenting. 
someone. So that is, as a, as a direction, you can say, we, I, we want to augment our experts. Imagine you're an engineer or you're a car mechanic. I already use the code word car mechanic, wearing a set of glasses, looking at the engine, and then it says, oh, perhaps you better check out this pipe here or you better check out that carburetor there. That's augmenting the mechanic, helping him do, do his job better, rather than automating him out of the picture. Finally, um, as an organizational viewpoint, you might decide you're an innovator and you want to use AI to experiment to try different things out. And these are, these are like outlooks as an, as an individual organization that you can say, okay, we are, as a philosophy, interested in innovating. So therefore, we're gonna use AI to experiment. Or we are interested, we think our people are experts in certain areas, that's our competitive differentiation. We are going to enhance them in some ways. At the moment, most AI is in the top one automation. I, I mentioned deep learning briefly. It's the most common form of machine learning or artificial intelligence. You don't have to know what this means. The only thing you need to understand is that it's kind of vaguely based on our brain with neurons. And you have layers of neurons. And as you move through each layer, there's an abstraction. So if you can imagine, um, if it's a picture of someone, then it will might, each abstraction might say, okay, the first layer just gets colors, second layer gets lines, third layer gets eyes, fourth layer gets, that's the theory. In real life, we do not know what those layers are doing. Um, the reason why deep learning is called deep is because we stack these layers deeply. That's the only reason. It doesn't, doesn't have any kind of uh, magical, it's not a magical thing. It's not. It's, it, that, that's somewhat of a hype. I mentioned crystals before. These are all the examples that deep learning is used in, which is why it's been very successful commercially. If you wanted to do a crystal classifier, you would have to, you can't get that off the shelf. You'd have to make it. You'd have to get thousands of crystals. You'd have to get a human being to say, that's a strong one, that's a weak one, that doesn't do anything at all, that's not a crystal. Um, and then put that into the, the computer and the computer would analyze that and go, okay, it can maybe recognize those crystals. Deep, but deep learning requires a lot of data for that to work. There are um, deep learning machines or software out there which is commoditized. So for example, a lot of object recognition. If you were a marketing person and you wanted to run a campaign which said we want to recognize all of our shirts or all of our hats, then you could use commoditized software and create a pipeline, say okay, We've already, it will already recognize people, it'll recognize shirts, we just need to add on top a little bit about our brand. So it's, there's a lot of commoditized stuff out there which you can use off the shelf for deep learning, which is great because it requires so much data that it's a lot of effort to create that stuff from scratch. I gave you a definition of models earlier. Um, I just wanted to, so machine learning and deep learning is all about teaching the model to do something, whether it's classify something, recognize something, analyze something. Um, I've got a very high level picture here. Imagine that in the middle you've got the model which has been learned and it has all these templates for recognizing animals. And then when new animals are given to the machine, it tries to recognize it. And if it's got lots of cats, it's gonna recognize the house cat pretty easily. If it doesn't have a Himalayan fox, it's gonna see all those similar things and it's gonna say, oh, it could be a dog, it could be a wolf, it could be, and the hummingbird is, is literally there. That's what it will say sometimes. It will say something ridiculous because deep learning systems learn, they don't learn like we do, right? They will see something in the image which looks vaguely hummingbird and that's as close as it got to a Himalayan fox. Maybe it's just the color of the hummingbird. Uh, and it'll go, oh, could be a hummingbird. 5% probability. So in order for the model to learn in, this, in deep learning, you need to give all the possible data that it could come across. Just how it learns, it's not, I've really covered that, it doesn't, it's not really that important. Um, it's all about data mostly, and can we, will it recognize the Himalayan fox later on? If we have an iPhone app which recognizes animals, but somebody happens to have a Himala Himalayan fox, is that a problem? Those sorts of questions. Do we need to then put Himalayan foxes into the system? So I've said it several times, data is hugely important and it influences everything in deep learning. For example, a lot of self-driving cars use deep learning. 
And the way they're learning is very different to the way we learn. When we, when we say, imagine a sheep runs across the road, we might not necessarily think it's a sheep. We're, our immediate reaction is, moving object is coming in front of my car. And then you might do some other analysis and go, okay, it's a sheep, or I just missed a cow, or whatever it was in the middle of the night. But the machine, or the deep learners, they start from the image. They don't start from a more abstract point of view. And that's why they can get confused. You see the zebra crossing up the top right and the zebra down on the left. The deep learning systems that are being trained to drive probably have never seen a zebra. But they have seen lots of zebra crossings. So who knows what's going to happen, right? They're going to just, there's a zebra crossing there. No one's on it. No one's riding that zebra. Just ride across it. Right? You don't know what it's going to do. The result of the way that deep learning learns, or the deep learning systems, creates these three things which are important. This is quite technical, but it's really important because you need to know whether these things are going to affect you when you deliver an AI system or you, en you embark upon an AI system. The overfitting issue is based on, the, it's, it's exactly that Himalayan fox. It, it has learned a whole bunch of data and it seems really accurate but in real life, it's not accurate because it recognises the hummingbird or it recognises something else. Uh, I've got actually a better example. Let me show it to you. This is the first exercise you do as an engineer when you are learning some deep learning software. You try to create a system which recognises these handwritten digits. And within about 10 minutes, you can create something which will recognize any of these handwritten digits to 98% accuracy. A few years ago it was 95, a few years before that it was 93. <clears throat> so a few years ago I just, I wrote this program, great, 98% accur accuracy, put it onto an iPhone app, put it in front of the number seven, it doesn't recognize it. But from our perspective it's like, this is the, re this is the perfect number seven. Why doesn't it see it? Because there's a whole bunch of other things that it thinks it's seven, not that. It's expecting a slightly grayed out seven. It's expecting a certain size. It's, it's expecting little curly stuff. It's, it's expecting a whole bunch of noise which we don't see, but is in the original data. And that's what overfitting is. The other aspect of deep learning is a lot of engineers, when they're doing deep learning systems, they have certain knobs to turn, like it's the architecture of the system or how fast it learns or how deep, how many layers. I showed you the layers in deep learning before. The problem is, because of the way deep, deep learning systems learn, you can make small adjustments to these knobs and you can get widely varied results. You can move from 99% to 70% just because you added one more neuron. And that gives you a hint that many times these systems are fragile. Um, unless you have a really huge amount of data, these systems can be very fragile. Finally, um, bias, you, you can see it coming up more and more. It refers to deep learning systems doing something which is what we see as ethically wrong. These are good examples. Um, or rather, the second one is hiring machine only chooses men engineers. Uh, HR machine automatically categorizes, no, profiling machine automatically categorizes dark skinned individuals as criminals. Uh, an HR machine will hire only men, not women because the data that have been put into the system, a bias is created. And the way there are some ways to get around that, oh, here's some examples. I can't see any difference between the hummingbirds, the two hummingbirds, but the machine can. That's, somebody's changed one pixel and, and now the machine thinks it's a hammer. The stickers on the stop sign, the, the self-driving car can't see the stop sign anymore. Um, put a little kind of funny coloured thing next to the banana, it no longer thinks it's a banana, a banana. it thinks it's a toaster. So it's, it's doing that? It's doing because that. And the, it's being told to because that. It's for being two told reasons, because the data, maybe the data's not, maybe, for example, with the dark-skinned criminal, yeah. maybe they only had white, maybe only had white people in the, in the, the sample size, mm -hmm. and they had one dark person who happened to be criminal. a criminal. It's going to say, okay, so, that, so that's the, so it's the data. And secondly, the other aspect is there is a whole, it creates abstractions that we cannot see. And it's very hard to see what those within the machine, within the black box. So, um, yeah. The other thing is, 
biases are, are really quite complicated. Um, I'll give you an example. As a young man in my 20s, I have to pay more, or I had to pay more for insurance because statistically speaking, young men have more accidents. Yeah, under 25. Yeah. yeah. You could do that with any ethnic group. You could just choose, you could just say, okay, let's sample in ethnic groups. And you, one ethnic group would statistically have more accidents. Just, you, doesn't know, you don't know what it is ahead of time. And then you can say, what, this ethnic group, whoever they are, Swedes from, I don't know, the west coast or near, near you have to bore it. You have more accidents than everyone else. You have to pay more insurance. That wouldn't, that wouldn't work, would it? We wouldn't let that happen. So if we have trouble, I mean, those are very narrow. If we have trouble kind of figuring out those biases, there's no way the machine's going to be able to do it. So there always has to be a human in the loop. That's the, basically the answer. There are, uh, very quickly, there are other types of AI uh, which are not deep learning and do not require the data that deep learning requires. Deep learning has had all the commercial su success. Expert systems were used in the past, very successful. These old school statistical systems are still used now. They're very useful for small data sets. The probabilistic one is coming up in the future. I didn't have a good example of it, but I threw it in there. Um, two really interesting ones are reinforcement learning and genetic programming. I mentioned reinforcement learning because it was the example I used before, where you, like imagine you're doing a school timetable, university timetable, you want to manage the resources. All you have to do is you put the, put the rules into the system, you don't need lots of data. You say that a student can only go to five subjects at once, these subjects are always at the same time, and then a, a kind of a simulation is created and you can really accurately um, resource plan or decide where to do deliveries or something. That, that's becoming, oh, reinforcement learning was used to beat the best Go player in the world. So the story there is, the original machine that beat Lee Sedol was trained with millions of hours of human games and machine games. The second iteration basically just played itself. They gave it the rules and it spent a, the, the amount of energy that Denmark uses in one day to to over several weeks to play itself and come up with a model that allowed it to beat the original machine very easily. So re reinforcement learning is coming in and the reason why it's important to know the difference is that you do not need the same data. If you're going to adopt AI or use AI, you don't need and you, you can use reinforcement learning for lots of things and you do not need that millions of pieces of data. Genetic algorithms currently are used primarily in design space and that's an example of a TED talk and it's similar to reinforcement learning. It creates a simulation. Uh, you give it some rules like saying, look, the chassis here has to have a certain structural strength, has to not look too ugly. Uh, it's going to be made of this material. And then the genetic algorithm will iterate through and try a whole bunch of things and see which one works best. So if we want to use AI, I've got a few things I can talk about. Here are the ways you could adopt AI. And that tends to influence what staff you need or what capability you need, um, and it's fairly obvious. We can buy stuff off the shelf. I mentioned that with the black box uh, deep learning stuff. You can find deep learning to recognize birds, for example. Um, you could use cloud services. My example with AMP, they used a whole bunch of cloud services for chatbots or, or auditing documents. Um, a third party, you could get uh, somebody who's really good at AI to provide services to you to come in and build it for you, or you can build your own. It's pretty obvious. Regardless of which model you choose, you the, the person, you still need some, someone in management who understands what the consequences are of choosing different types of AI, what they need to do to facilitate it and integrate it into the organization. Many people talk, especially the technical folk, will talk about, or the researchers will say, there aren't enough PhDs in the world, but engineers can pick up any of that AI stuff in a few weeks. There's no problem with engineers learning AI. The difficulty is m higher up in the chain, the decision makers saying, okay, how are we gonna use AI? What possible AI technology could we use? How are we going to integrate it? Do we need our own team to do that? Do they need any data? How, let's ideate and decide how we're gonna do that and then we can try a prototype, see if it works and then iterate like that. So from my perspective, the missing element 
uh, is management, understanding enough about AI, not technical. We do not need PhDs to adopt AI. These are some things that are important. I think managerial vision is related to what I just said. AI is a little bit different to, say, doing a mobile app or doing a website. You do need to spend some time experimenting. You do need to try stuff out. You might need to say, that model's not going to work. We're not going to be able to get good accuracy there. But can we put a human in the loop? Can we get the human to do the first stage? And then we add the machine. Or can we augment the human? So that experiment, I think it's very important to have that experimental outlook. Uh, common AI strategies, just strategy stuff, not really that relevant to AI. Do you save money? Do you make money? Do you innovate? Do you automate? Create new products? Andrew Ng, who is, who is one of the most famous AI guys, had this um, cycle of how you create your own AI capability. It's, if you're interested, I can send it to you. Um, these are the things that get in the way. I kind of mentioned most of these. Not having data with deep learning, that's one. Um, the experimentation I mentioned. Not having... I read an article the other day which said, an AI strategy is like having an Excel strategy. And um, I worked in a bank in Switzerland, and they should have had an Excel strategy. They had every... They had something like one and a half billion... Swiss francs, working on Excel Swiss systems that crashed every five minutes. You, if something, if such a huge thing is going to affect your business, then you need to have some sort of strategy around it. So I think it's important to have an AI strategy if it's going to affect your business. A uh, thing close and dear to my heart is AI innovation. You've probably gathered that. Using AI to create new products, uh, using AI to experiment. Um, there's my little diagram on that. Um, why do we innovate? The, for the usual reasons. It's, if you're in the entrepreneurial sphere, it's, of course, it's an easy sell. But those are the reasons. You, you want to compete. You want to save time. You want new sources of revenue. You want to improve somebody's life, maybe with healthcare. You want to come out with a new healthcare therapy, which helps people with allergies or something like that. That's why we innovate. These are three things that I think are important when you're innovating in, in AI. I had a friend who sat down with his team and for two days to try and come up with some way that they could use AI. And they're in the uh, compliance conveyancing area. They couldn't come up with any ideas. Um, I have a piece of software that I wrote where I just, okay, I'll just out, look up some examples in the real world. And there are some examples. Tag documents, audit contracts, court transcriptions. So the idea part of using AI is very important. You still need to ideate like any other innovation process. Here is a, I won't go through it, a flow of, uh, I think I was doing a ideation around that topic I brought up before about recognizing brands. Imagine you were doing a campaign to try and make your brand more popular. And so you wanted to say, okay, we're going to use an AI system and we're going to walk around whenever we recognize somebody in Darling Harbour who has our shirt on we're going to reward them. That's, it's kind of like an advertising campaign. And so I was just going through the process of, at each stage, like, do we use AI? What else could we use? And then at each stage, you, you try and create more ideas to try and solve the problem. The thick arrows here are is where you broaden the, t the funnel of ideas, and then you narrow, the, narrow it. So here, you, idea, you kind of do an ideation on what are the tasks that we could do AI with? Once we've chosen the task uh, and we have done sort of due diligence on whether somebody might want it, whether there's any competition, then we say, how can we, once we've chosen that task, how can we make, solve that problem with AI? Then we might decide, okay, we're going to use that. And then we go through each of those things and try and solve that problem by expanding and, and, and contracting. I'm going to, I already mentioned this. The other thing you can do, uh, with, apart from ideas, is focus on your people. Try and make your people... Um, more expert than they already are. Try and augment your people. That's in that way you bring about more innovative products or more innovative, innovative focus. And I've already mentioned this as well, and that is AI is great for creating. What well, you don't create a simulation with AI, but imagine you're you're an economist. You create a simulation of a market, 
and then you use AI within that simulation to try and determine best pricing strategies or best ways that you can interact with other um, agents within the system. Uh, another example could be um, a cell. If we're trying to create a health therapy, let's create a simulation of a cell with all mitochondria and so on inside. What happens if we move the mitochondria to the cell nucleus? So you create, so that's kind of an experimental thing. You use a simulation to try a lot of, you ask a lot of different questions. What if we did this? What if we did that? Um, here, that, I just talked about that. There are a lot of things in the world called, they're called digital twins. For example, Airbus has a digital twin of one of their planes and they can know ahead of time which parts are going to need replacement because the, the twin within the computer mimics what's going on in the outside world but you can run time much faster. Um, you could potentially do a forest, rainforest simulation. How, if we wanted to expand the rainforest, how would that work? Let's create a simulation. We're going to plant certain types of trees. What are the flows within that? We don't need a lot of data for that, but we can experiment and say, yeah, we could, the rainforest itself creates its own ecosphere and its own, and so therefore we don't need as much water as we expect. You might discover that through the experimentation process. Very quickly, this is how you run a project. Once you've done all that ideation and you decide what you're going to do, collect the data if you need it. You will always need to clean the data. Those handwritten numbers, they had to be cleaned, right? Everyone had to put a little square around that. Make sure there's not too much white space or dark space. Train the models. Deploy it to the world. If it's seeing too many hummingbirds, then you need to integrate new data so that it can recognize foxes or dogs. Um, I've got an example here. This is literally what it looks like. The top right is the simulation I was talking about, but let's just look at the left. We collect a whole bunch of data on cats we, and dogs, or not cats. We kind of adjust the data so that it fits within the system. We train the model. We deploy and hopefully it recognizes animals when we want it to. You kind of know my conclusion already. My primary driver, despite the fact that I'm really into AI, is that I want AI to help us. And helping us does not mean destroying jobs, for example. No one knows, no one can agree on how many jobs AI may destroy. But there are a lot of systemic, I talked about DevOps before, focuses on optimization, efficiency, which is driving towards this thing where we try and replace humans and automate things. I believe that it's better that we focus on human enhancement, like trying to help people do their jobs better rather than taking their jobs away from them. Uh, but in order to be able to focus on that, we need to just educate ourselves. So that's my message. Educate yourselves on AI and you can choose where you want to go. Without knowing enough about, without knowing AI, you're not going to be able to say, okay, I want to stop job losses. Um, with knowing AI, you know what your options are. We can use AI as an ally rather than as, a, as a, our master. Our master. Our master.